Atari, one of the most storied gaming companies of all time. A brand that started off with a bang and ended life with an unceremonious plop. From its founder Nolan Bushnell through to the reign of the Trammell family, Atari dreamed of dominating the living room space, and in the early 90s, they attempted to do just that with their Jaguar multimedia system. This is Retro Impressions' unreleased Atari Jaguar. As the Jags launch date neared, Atari had amassed over 2.5 million pre-orders in Europe alone, but manufacturing issues prior to release resulted in Atari's inability to deliver any consoles to Europe causing cancellations of nearly every single pre-order. To further compound this issue, Atari required some retailers to carry the links if they wanted to distribute the Jag. This caused many stores who were on board from the start to jump ship. From its launch in 1993 until its end in 98, the Jaguar sold a meager 225,000 units. To put this in perspective, that's less than the PCFX, CDI, 3DO, and 32X. The 3DO, which also launched in 1993, outsold the Jaguar nearly 4.5 to 1, while the 32X outsold the Jaguar nearly 5 to 1, though it only had a lifespan of around 12 months. While it's hard to definitively state why the Jaguar failed, there are three reasons that in my mind are direct causes. First off is a lack of games at launch and throughout the active years of the console's life. When the Jaguar released, only two games accompanied the system, Cybermorph and the incomplete Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy. Both of these games received lukewarm reviews at best, so while Atari did an excellent job of marketing the hardware, there was nothing worth playing on it. Up to the release of Tempest 2000 in April 1994, which was the Jag's first must-own game, only four games in total had released. That's four games over a nearly six-month time span. By the start of 1995, the Jag had just 17 games available and lacked third-party support to the point that Brutal Sports was the only non-Atari published game on the system. While 1995 would finally see games from outside publishers with 25 new releases, the system had already been deemed a lost cause. To me, the fact that the software wasn't there to support the hardware was a death sentence, ensuring the Jag's doom from the day it hit store shelves. That didn't have to be the story though. A delayed release and better planning to meet early demand of pre-orders, along with third-party negotiations to ensure great games were available at launch, might have created the sustained success the system needed to become a major player in an already overcrowded market. Considering that wasn't the case though, there is one more thing Atari might have done to fix their situation. Sometimes for systems who have received dismal launches, there's redemption, and that almost always coincides with an early price reduction along with a killer app. This is something the Jag wouldn't fully accomplish for an insanely long time. To put this in perspective, I've asked my friend Vince from Vince19 to explain. Thanks, Genovi. From my data analysis, the fifth generation of gaming was probably the most competitive in gaming history. If you look at the consoles of the fifth generation, along with the approximate number of days that it took for each of them to have its first price cut, and the percentage size of that price cut once it hit, you can easily see that the cuts came fast and big. On average, the fifth generation was the most aggressive of any recent gaming generation in terms of those two metrics. But clearly, there's one big exception here. The JAG. A system that sat on shelves for more than 500 days before a price cut would happen. An absolute eternity in a competitive environment like this. And when the cut did come, it was big. Probably desperately big. Atari was essentially operating from paycheck to paycheck and couldn't afford to slash the price of the Jag until the cost to manufacture one decreased. It was a system doomed from launch by poorly executed decisions that quickly eroded all consumer goodwill and even with a correctly timed price cut, I'm doubtful it would have ever recovered. In my opinion, Atari did everything right to market their system, so a lot of developers threw their hat in the Jag development race only to abandon their games part way through after it became apparent that Atari didn't have the resolve to right the ship they had launched only half prepared to sail. I think it's important to note here that Atari had seen the system as a failure by mid-1995 and had stopped all orders for new hardware production. By the end of 95, only 125,000 units had sold, with 100,000 units remaining in inventory. 
From mid-1995 until 1998, Atari's only Jaguar-related goal was to clear out their remaining stock and finish games near completion to help support that cause. Contrary to popular belief, the stop order for manufacturing new hardware included the CD add-on and new Pro Controller, meaning that they were cancelled before they ever hit store shelves. The 20,000 CD units Atari had on hand were ordered before they put a stop to all Jaguar hardware production, as it was planned out in 94 for a mid-1995 launch. So the units that were manufactured for launch were all that would ever be available, as Atari shifted gears to try to liquidate their failed system, games, and accessories, something they told investors they weren't sure could ever be accomplished. As far as the CD system goes, it's one of the more baffling moves Atari would make amongst a list of dumb decisions. To clarify, it's not the launch of an expensive hardware add-on for a dead system I take issue with. The system wasn't dead when the project was conceived or initially put into production. It said it offered nothing to the user beyond the ability to play games using a CD format should they be made available and of course the CD player itself. The CD player was notable for its included music visualizer by Jeff Minter, but that's it. There was no enhancement chips, additional processors, or anything to help boost the JEG's capabilities in any way. This means a cart with enough space could do everything the CD format could, but without the long load times. Like the Sega 32X, there were even plans for an all-in-one console called the Jaguar Duo, but both systems ended life early without seeing their full plan realized. With that said, CD versions of JEG cart games such as Tempest 2000 won't be covered in this series. Due to a lack of transparency with Atari and their early hype surrounding this system, there's an impressive amount of unreleased JEG games, more than I could discuss in a 30-part in-depth series. So as I work my way down the list, I will cover the most interesting stories while giving passing mention to the others so we can cover them all while keeping it interesting. I'm going to cover the rules, then jump right into it. The rules for inclusion are simple. There has to be some proof that the game was in development be it in an article in a magazine, known copy of a prototype, a retail order sheet, an interview with a developer, etc. With that, let's get started. ACDC Defender of Metal was a game in early development for the Jaguar system. This beat em up would see the band fight through a number of stages, each representing a different genre of music. It was planned for the CD add-on so it could include a full Redbook OTS by the band. The Jag was weeks from being discontinued when the proposal was floated, so the game never went into full production. One screenshot and the proposal is all that remains. Arrow the Acrobat was a mascot platformer developed by Sunsoft's American Division. The game was developed simultaneously for the Genesis and SNES, where it was well received upon release selling well enough to warrant two sequels. With the JEG announced and the platform looking to have a strong launch, Sunsoft came on board as a developer and started work porting the first game to Atari's upcoming system. As far as I can tell, it was in development as the system launched and it remained so, being listed as an upcoming game in many magazines through to the end of 1994. Nothing was ever released about the port, so it's unknown how it would have differed from the original release. Aliens vs Predator is one of the most well-known games for the JAG. It, along with Tempest 2000, are often cited as a reason to own the system. AVP, as it's usually called, was a first-person shooter that allowed the player to be human, alien, or predator. The game was so advanced that some framework would later be used for 007 on the N64. But that's a story for a future video. The original game was funded by Atari and is without question the best-selling game for the system. There is, however, the question of how many did the game actually sell? Atari loved spreading misinformation, so taking their quotes as facts is a fool's errand at best. According to Atari in what was a paid supplemental in Edge magazine during the summer of 1995, AVP had sold over 85,000 copies. If this was true, it held a system attach rate of over 70%. That's better than Super Mario Bros. 1 or 3 on the NES, both of which were pack-in titles. This number, from this document, is cited everywhere you look, and to be frank, it's false. In fact, the whole pamphlet is full of misinformation when it comes to declaring Jag's success by overstating hardware sales figures by double their correct amount. Atari knew their system was in trouble when this pamphlet released, having already pulled the plug on the system, yet they boldly state their expectations to sell over 1.4 million consoles by the end of the year. This was a flat-out lie by a company that already knew that 225,000 JAG consoles were all that would ever be made. So, how many copies did AVP sell? It's impossible to say, but I think it's important to point out 
that with dramatically overstated figures, 85,000 is almost certainly not correct. Still, internal documents prove it outsold Cybermorph and Tempest 2000, and being a console's best-selling game is a good reason to consider a sequel. I'm sure Atari expected the game to help sell the Jag during the Christmas of 94, which it might have to some small degree, but it was nowhere near enough. AVP couldn't save Atari's system, but it found enough success that they entered into negotiations for a sequel in 1994. The game was planned out from start to end, with storyboards and the script finished by mid-1995. The development house was switched from Rebellion Studios to Beyond Games for unknown reasons, but it's assumed that the head designer and programmer from the first game was still on board as they worked directly for Atari rather than Rebellion. By April 1996, High Voltage Software and Beyond Games reported that Atari had long ago stopped communication regarding the Jaguar. 20th Century Fox owned the rights to all assets associated with AVP's development, so when Atari jumped ship, they brought back Rebellion to make a PC-exclusive game using the ideas outlined in the AVP2 proposal for the Jaguar. The game were released in 99, and Rebellion has continued to be involved in the creation of Aliens vs Predator themed games, with their last series release in 2010. American Hero is best described as a choose-your-own-adventure inspired movie very similar to the Black Mirror's Bandersnatch. The player would watch the movie and be prompted at a specific time to choose the action the character would make, resulting in a number of possible outcomes. There's an unusually small amount of information out there regarding this game's history, especially considering it was so close to complete. Even the nearly finished beta has been released to the public. Unfortunately, it uses the CD format, making it rather inaccessible to most people. The game's story was typical of 90s action flair and included notable actors to boot. My guess as to why it was never moved to another console has to do with FMV games falling out of favor around this time. Another World was a very popular cinematic platformer released in the early 90s that was highly influential to the genre itself. A port was started for the Jag with a late 1994 planned release, but it never materialized. Fast forward to 2012 and a group called The Removers, along with RGC, obtained authorization and support from the game's creator to formally port Another World to the Jag. The game was built from the ground up to take every advantage of the hardware possible. By 2014, the game had gone into limited production, selling out. It had been cancelled for 20 years, but Another World finally had an officially sanctioned release on Jaguar hardware. Arena Football was an exclusive game for the Jag with a planned release of 1994, making it by far the first Arena Football game had it shipped. Unfortunately, the programmer V-Real Interactive found the Jag to be challenging to program for, putting the game many months behind schedule. Low interest in pre-orders, along with the added cost to finish development, would be the ultimate reason this game was cancelled. Years later, it was discovered that the game was nearly complete as it was dumped online. Repos of the unfinished beta are out there and easy to acquire should you want to check this one out. That's it for this episode. In case you're wondering about my personal feelings on the Jag, it's one of my favorite consoles. I own around half of the library, including a sizable portion of post-generation releases. As this series tends to run in mostly alphabetical order, I'm going to discuss games you might find on other lists that didn't make the cut here, so stick around after the credits for this special segment. Also, if you have any information of games I might have glossed over that should have made the cut, make sure you leave a message in the comments or DM me on Twitter with the information. Huge thanks to Vince19, Robert Martinez, Atari Age, and Retro HQ for answering questions and contributing to the creation of this series. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Your support means the world to me. As always, feel free to leave a positive or negative comment down below. I try to read and reply to everyone and appreciate the opportunity to interact with you all. Until the next episode, to wherever you may be watching, good morning, good evening, and good night. I'm Genovi, and you've been watching Retro Impressions. Now for games that didn't make the cut. I really struggled as to if I should include Area 51. It was developed for and released on the Kojag, an arcade conversion of the Jaguar's home console that included upgraded hardware. The game was fairly well received, receiving ports to a number of systems. Though a conversion back to the base Jaguar was possible, I find it unlikely and more so a candidate for the planned but unreleased Jaguar 2. 
Adventure is by all accounts one of the most fondly remembered Atari 2600 games to ever release, and one of the most influential of all time. A full remake for the JAG was in the works, and rumor has it was fairly far along in development. It was a flat-shaded full 3D game by 3D Stooges, a company that would release homebrews for the hardware years after the system was cancelled. A screenshot even exists, but the question remains, was it a homebrew or in development while the system was still being supported? Only one man knows, and that's the game's programmer, Steve Scavone. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any contact information for him. Interestingly, he was very active in the JAG homebrew scene, releasing two games and was very well known in the early 2000s for his mastery of the hardware. Allegiance is often cited as a cancelled game by Team 17, who would later go on to create Worms. The game was in development for PC, but in October 1995, Team 17 publicly stated that the game had been cancelled and had never started any kind of production for any system outside of the PC. The link here is that they were a licensed JAG developer at the time. Artemis is a game I didn't discuss because I've been working on a standalone episode that looks at the game's creator. It's a bit too complex to include here and cover the story as I would like, so it didn't happen. I'm also not fully convinced it was ever intended for the JAG, but rather the Jaguar 2. American Football by Parker Brothers was the only other game I looked at that is often cited, but without supporting evidence.